I'm going to quickly take advantage and do a very quick analysis of the Middle East, of the main nations that move there, so that we have a point of view, a perspective of what media is currently operating in. The nation of Israel, for example, Iran, Iran in 1935, changed its name from Persia to Iran, to the Republic of Iran when they defeated the Shah of Iran. If you come to the Bible, we find names that do not correspond to the current nations. And the only thing we can do to discover what nation the Bible is talking about, it is the geographical place where the Bible places them. So we will see later Ezekiel 38, where Persia is mentioned, coming with Magog, with Gog, to attack Israel. And Persia has been Iran since 1935. 1979. The name was changed again to the Islamic Republic of Iran by Ayatollah Khomeini. Then Iran is currently, currently, the most dangerous protagonist nation in the entire world. It is the one that finances Hamas, the one that finances Hezbollah, which means the People's Party. By the way, Hamas means for those who are interested, violence in Hebrew. Hamas means violence in Hebrew. Hezbollah, the People's Party, the Houthis of Yemen in Arabia, the Fatah, and this entire system of Islamic Jihad are financed by Iran. One of the reasons that yesterday, the President of the United States, Joe Biden, said that he considered that the reason why Hamas attacked Israel is because Iran realized that Israel is making deals with Saudi Arabia to enter the Abraham Agreement and Iran does not want Saudi Arabia to join forces with Israel. So, to prevent and confront Saudi Arabia with Israel, it rushed Hamas in, which was a completely desperate attack. That turned on them, right? As we say, here in Mexico, their rifle completely turned and they pointed it at themselves because they are going to be completely torn apart and about to disappear. Because Hezbollah did not help them, the Houthis did not help them, no nation, those in Hamas believed that at that moment everyone was going to come against Israel. No one extended their hand to help them. And they are advancing to look for them, and there is no one who dares to look for them. Ball of cowards. The other terrorist groups. But Iran desperately needs soldiers in Syria because since the invasion of Ukraine, Iran has been the crony of Russia and China. Iran has the Hezbollah group in Lebanon, which is just north of Israel, Lebanon. Lebanon does not have a government either, what Hamas did in Gaza. Striking the Palestinian Authority is what Hezbollah did with the government in Lebanon. So in Lebanon, the government is Hezbollah. That is the terrorist group that has the government of Lebanon under its feet, completely dominating the government of Lebanon. The terrorist group Hezbollah is financed 100% by Iran and receives the same pressure from Iran because it is estimated that Hezbollah has 300,000 rockets. 300,000 rockets. And when Hamas believed that when attacking Israel or invading Israel, they were going to launch all the rockets and Israel was going to be between two fires, they did not launch a single rocket. God continues to act in an incredible way. The head of Hezbollah is called Hassan Nasrallah, who is one of the leaders of Iran. I repeat, the Hezbollah group and the Hamas group are controlled, directed, supported and financed by the nation of Iran. Yemen, which is another nation in the Arab Persian Gulf. There is another terrorist group there called the Houthis, or the Houthis in English. They have declared war on Israel with 50,000 terrorists. Just see how the Middle East is on fire. 
Everyone is waiting for the opportunity to exterminate the Jewish nation. And Yemen is located 1,600 kilometers from Israel. This group is also financed by Iran. They have rockets that they have already started launching. Last week and two days ago, they launched more than 25 rockets against Israel. Let's look at Egypt, which was currently the only nation that opened a passage called Fatah for the Palestinians to flee to the south of Gaza, which was allowed for them to flee. And Israel told them, everyone go to the south because we are going north. The main group of Hamas terrorists are hiding there. And Egypt allowed a little bit of Palestinians to enter because Egypt doesn't want Palestinians either. They don't want problems, they don't want violence, and also, since the last century, there have only been two Arab nations that are united in peace with Israel, which is Egypt and Jordan. That's it, since 1948, when they became independent. And this 21st century that we are currently in, President Trump has been the only president who has been able to achieve what is called the Abraham Accords where they are now no longer Jordan and Egypt, now they are the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and Morocco. Now, there are five nations that have already shaken hands with Israel and promised not to intervene. Now that Hamas intervened, and more than 75. Leaders in Russia met with Putin to discuss the Hamas problem. The Arabs abstained. Bahrain, Morocco, United Arabs and Saudi Arabia have always said, we are going to enter into negotiations with Israel when Israel allows the Palestinians a state within its territory. And that is why Saudi Arabia has not yet signed any agreement, but knows that it needs the protection of Israel. And Saudi Arabia's airspace is used by the greatest pilots in the world. The best pilots in the world, who are the Jews, with F-35s which is the fastest combat aircraft that exists and the most accurate. So, although Saudi Arabia has not signed a peace with Israel, they allow them to use the airspace so their F-35s can fly. This is more or less the situation. Jordan, in the Bible, appears as the hypocritical nation. Because do you know where Lot came from? Do you remember Lot? Genesis 19, that he had relations with his two daughters and that Moab and Edom were born? Well, when you see Edom and Moab in the Old Testament, it is Jordan. Jordan descends from Lot's people, and according to Daniel 11:45 to 47, they will betray Israel at the end, Jordan. We also see Europe that is sandwiched. On one side, Russia, on the other side, the United States, and to the north, China and Russia. So, Europe depends on 65% of gas from Russia, 65% of gas depends on Russia, the European Union. That's why when Putin invades Ukraine, Germany did not want to enter. Other nations did. Well, NATO, we are going to enter here and there but they finally decided that they were not going to help other than sending very superficial aid to Ukraine. Because Putin told them, I am going to turn off the tap. And if the tap is turned off, they will freeze to death. Now within Europe, the only nation, the only nation in Europe right now that has survived is Germany. Spain, Portugal, Italy, and Greece are in total economic bankruptcy. The European Bank and the International Monetary Fund can no longer give a dollar of aid to any of these nations. And the second nation that has survived is France because it is next to Germany. And now that Angela Merkel left as Prime Minister of Germany, right? Schultz has now entered as Minister of Germany and is hoping in some way that now that Putin stays in Ukraine or continues advancing, under whose wings will Europe be in now? because the United States has always been the one that has protected Europe through NATO. NATO is the Organization of the Nations of the North Atlantic that was formed in 1947 by the Army of Europe 
to protect itself from the invasion of the communists. So, every nation that belongs to NATO in Europe, if they hurt Spain, all of Europe joins. If they hurt France, join Europe. If they hurt Ukraine, they cannot enter, because Ukraine does not belong to NATO. And when Putin saw that NATO was beginning to advance towards the north and east of Europe, and realized that if they reached Ukraine, they were going to convince Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, to join NATO, Russia would disappear. Because the day that NATO gets there, or the United States, in Ukraine, from Ukraine to Moscow, there are 12 minutes for a rocket to arrive. So, by placing nuclear weapons on the border, which is almost the border with Russia, Russia cannot strategically or militarily risk having an enemy on its border. It's what happened in 62 with Cuba and the United States, remember? That Kennedy, President John Kennedy, through the satellites that were already beginning to work, discovered that Nikita Khrushchev placed satellites in Cuba, pointing at the United States here, so blatantly. Pointing here. Then, President Kennedy picks up the phone and says to Nikita Khrushchev, You know what? Either you take it out, or the Third World War comes, it was the first threat in the last century of a world war, because there was going to be a world war. So thank God that this conflict lasted two weeks, Khrushchev was convinced, and they removed the rockets and went to Russia. But they were on the verge of entering into a war, because the United States is not going to allow rockets pointing towards its country. Nor is Russia going to allow Ukraine to be pointing towards its country, the United States, nor NATO either. Now in Ukraine there are more than 1,500 factories of antibiotics and chemicals for manufacturing vaccines. Ah, now we are understanding right why you allow yourself to be vaccinated. So, it doesn't suit President Biden. It doesn't suit him. Because all these clandestine factories in Ukraine produce billions, billions of dollars for Biden and Bill Gates, who owns Pfizer and Moderna. So when they began to plan the vaccination, they began to make very serious mistakes that people like little sheep fell into the trap. I say they fell because my wife and I did not fall, I don't know how many of you. But from the beginning I realized, hey, how is it possible that I go to a restaurant and they tell me, please, cover up. And when you get to the table, remove it there. That is, when you get to the table, there is no virus, Riz. How is it possible that on the plane, they tell me, while you are eating peanuts and soft drinks, you can remove your mask? I called it the muzzle or the scarf, right? And I would put it on again, and the viruses were gone. How is it possible for a plane, 350 people, 250 people, at the exit to say, keep a healthy distance? Are you kidding me? We are in a world of people who have no mercy for human beings. Unbelievable what is happening. Europe is going to have to search biblically because the Antichrist is going to emerge from one of the nations of the ancient Roman Empire. The ancient Roman Empire consisted of Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. For a long time, especially in the 20th century, many eschatologists, that is, students of prophecies, said that the Antichrist was going to come out of Rome, and that the Antichrist was going to come out of Europe. But the more we study the Bible, the more we are convinced that the Antichrist emerges from the Middle East. Currently, Europe, listen to this. In three or four years Europe, there have been millions of Muslim refugees who come to France. In England, there are more mosques than Christian churches. In Germany, and in France, and in Spain mostly. In three years, in three years, Europe will be a Muslim continent. Because the Europeans are a population of old people. They no longer reproduce. They do not want to have children. The Muslims reproduce like rabbits. For each European, seven Muslims are born. So, in three years, Europe is a Muslim continent. 
just as the Bible prophesied, that the final war in the world, the war of Gog and Magog, would be between the Islamic world and the Jewish Christian world. The two strongest currents that exist, religiously, for the entire world. And Europe will have to do something important because the Antichrist is going to emerge when we hear that five nations from Europe and five from the Middle East, Daniel chapter 2, chapter 7, unite. When we hear, pay attention, when we hear, a G10, five nations from Europe, five from the East, joined together, they made a pact, all ten. From one of these nations, the little horn or the Antichrist will arise. And according to Daniel 8, which we will see later, it arises between Iraq and Syria. That is why the Antichrist is called the Assyrian. From Genesis chapter 10, Nimrod, who is the first prototype of the Antichrist who founded Syria and Babylon? Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq, is the second most mentioned nation in the Bible after Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the most mentioned city. Jerusalem is mentioned more than 350 times, followed by Babylon. And Babylon begins from Genesis and ends in Revelation. With Revelation 17, Religious Babylon, Commercial Babylon, Revelation 18. So we are facing an unbelievable world. And now, the most amazing of all, let's go to Ezekiel, chapter 38. And the most impressive nation after Iran is Turkey. Turkey which appears in the Bible under the name of Togarma. The region of Turkey, Armenia, and all those areas is called Anatolia, formerly, or also the Magogite area. But what's most impressive is, we recently confused some journalists. How is it possible that Christians say that Turkey is going to join Russia. And now that Putin has come against Ukraine, Turkey belongs to NATO. So who will you imagine is going to fight against Russia? Or that? Is going to fist or uh, side with Russia to fight against Europe if it belongs to NATO? How is President Erdogan, who is currently the president of Turkey, going to betray NATO? How is he going to side with Russia to fight the United States? When he has received most of Turkey from the United States, well, the Bible prophesied 2700 years ago, right down in Ezekiel 2700 BC. Not before Nostradamus, please. Or Walter Mercado. Almost 2700 years ago, says Ezekiel 38, verse 3. Thus says the Lord God, I am against you, O Gog, sovereign prince of Meshech and Tubal. Those who want to write it down, Gog is the name or a title of a leader, commander, Caesar, Tsar, general, head of something. The word Gog in Hebrew is head or leader of something. So here the Holy Spirit is talking about a leader called Gog. And who is a sovereign prince? Rosh. In the Hebrew, Nashik, Meshek, and Tubal, which is the region of Turkey. After Putin invades Ukraine. Erdogan, the president of Turkey, who allowed a self-coup months before in Turkey to stay in power, and the largest mosque in Turkey, the Holy One, which was previously Christian, he turns it into a mosque to really understand the background. And Erdogan gives a speech saying the following, I have been chosen by Allah to be the next caliph of the Muslim world, of the world of Islam. And his desire and his arrogance is to be the leader of all Islam 
in the Middle East. But Russia and China are fighting the Middle East, and the U.S. too. In other words, the Middle East, as we said at first, is the bone of contention, where World War III breaks out. Why? China, Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, the United States, they all want to take part in the Middle East, and whoever controls the Middle East controls the world. Why? Because the Middle East contains 65% of the world's oil reserves. Below Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, that entire area, 65% of the world's oil reserves and now that the war has come with Putin against Ukraine and he had control of the gas and oil, Europe brought the entire world to its knees. And Biden? No. We are going to impose economic sanctions on Putin. We are going to block all international relations or international transfers with the SWIFT that the banks will no longer accept any rubles, the Russian currency, etc., etc., and we will sink Putin without realizing that he had the key to the gas, without realizing that he is friends with Iran and Russia, who have oil in Saudi Arabia. So what Biden did was sink Europe, because Putin took revenge. And what is Putin's secret revenge? It's going to be a message that I'm preparing. Putin's secret weapon was the following. Listen very carefully. Right now Putin, regardless of evil and everything, is the most intelligent military strategist of the 21st century. There is no one right now in the world, no Ilautan or the United States, no one who compares with the strategy of the one who was head of the KGB, of the Russian secret service. So Putin already had this plan for four or five years. And when economic sanctions are imposed by the United States, Putin's secret weapon is the following. What is the weak point of the United States? Its nuclear power? No, Russia has more nuclear power than the United States. What is the weak point of the United States? Well, they don't have as much protection as Israel has and Russia has either. The weak point of the United States is the dollar. 1947-48, the Bretton Woods summit is held. The Second World War ends, and the nations. That won the Second World War, England, Russia, Canada, the United States. Vote, first was the free sterling, but it lost, that the dollar would be the currency. That was going to govern. The purchase of oil, that is, since 75 or more years. Russia wants to buy oil. It has to convert rubles into dollars. Mexico wants to buy oil. It has to convert the Mexican peso into dollars. When the European Union was not there, France wants to buy, the francs have to be converted into dollars. In other words, all nations have been governed by the dollar for more than 75 years. So Putin joins with Russia, with Iran, with China, with North Korea, and with India to take away from the dollar. The weight it has to buy oil and if this happens this year or end of the year, listen to me very carefully. If they manage to take away the current dollar, which is sinking at an impressive speed, and replace the dollar with the yuan or the Russian ruble, the United States will sink to the bottom. Why does it sink? Because their foreign debt is $33 trillion. And... Right now, no one can collect from them because they control all the dollars. But if they take away the dollar's model to govern and the purchase of oil, then the United States sinks economically and hits rock bottom and goes to second or third place in its political, economic, and military supremacy. And it is, as it says, the Bible. The United States does not appear in the Bible. Goodbye, San Antonio. And neither is Mexico. The entire American continent is going to disappear. Did you know? How do we know? Because the fifth seal, Revelation 6, a quarter of humanity disappears in the first bombs. A quarter of humanity. We are now 8 billion. 
Billion people, how much is a quarter? Two billion people. From Alaska to Patagonia, the American continent. We are 1150 million human beings. We do not even reach 2,000. Two American continents are going to disappear in the nuclear war. When Christ comes, a third part, a third part of humanity is the one that survived. The nuclear war, in which the world is on the verge of self-destruction, against each other. All of this is incredible in light of everything we are seeing. Because right now, it is Russia that has control of gas, oil, and grain. So when Erdogan saw that Russia was imposing sanctions and that it no longer had oil, Erdogan in Turkey, or grain, he says, if my people realize that there is no grain and there is no oil, they are going to give me a coup. Then Erdogan said, I join with Russia and began to pose with Putin and with the Ayatollah of Iran and with Xi Jinping of China. And now we see photos everywhere of Xi Jinping, Putin, the Ayatollah, and Erdogan of Turkey. And to Erdogan's note of telling NATO, see you there. The moment Erdogan says goodbye to Europe, Turkey has the most powerful army in NATO. England has already left it. Do you remember Brexit? England has already left. Now Turkey is leaving. Europe is left like a helpless chick. What are they going to do? Biblically, they will ask the Arabs for help to form a G10 and be able to subsist and survive and rebuild Europe after what is coming. How unbelievable is all this that we are seeing? And let's go right here in Ezekiel 38 to the other nations that the Bible prophesied, which are the nations that currently already form this alliance, this alliance of Russia, China, Iran, Korea, etc., etc., had never been formed in history, ever, neither in the First nor the Second World War. And the Bible prophesies the alliance, in which Russia will have to attack Israel, maybe this year, next year, we don't know, but it is one of the next wars that we should expect in the world. Verse 5 says, Persia. Write it down, it's Iran. Cousin Foot. How do we know which nations are Cousin Foot? Well, in Genesis chapter 10 of the Bible, there are the 70 nations, descendants of the three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You and I, all of us, the whole world are descended from the three sons of Noah. The Japhethites formed. The entire Anglo-Saxon, European world, all those with white skin, light eyes, are Anglo-Saxons. The Semites are the Arabs and the Jews and Asia Minor. And the Hamites, or Ham, is the African continent. So if you go to Genesis chapter 10, verse 2 and 3, you will see that those who descend from Ham are precisely Cuz and Fut, which are the nations of Libya, Morocco, Sudan, or Ethiopia, which are the nations of North Africa and are all Muslim. Incredible. Then put there Iran, Sudan, Ethiopia, Gomer, which is Germany, Togarma, which is Turkey, write it down in your Bible. And next to Turkey is Armenia, most likely. Because the word Yereka Shafavo in Hebrew means out of the north parts. And whenever we are given a geographical location, the north is north of Israel, not north of San Antonio, nor from Mexico. Always all nations and all locations. In the Bible, its central point. The thermometer of God. The central point of God is the nation of Israel. Let's see why in Amos chapter 9, Amos chapter 9, 
those who brought their Bible verse 14 and 15, put there next to verse 14 and 15. On May 14, 1948, this prophecy was fulfilled completely. Gentlemen, political scientists, atheists, agnostics who are here with us or watching online. Amos 9, 14 and 15, and it was written 2,500 years ago. I will bring my people Israel out of captivity. They will build the desolate cities. They will inhabit them. They will plant vineyards. They will drink wine from them. For I will plant them on their land and never. Again, they will be uprooted from their land that I gave them, says the Lord your God. In the year 70 after Christ, the Roman general Titus arrives and destroys Jerusalem. Not one stone was left upon another. The papyri, the writings of the Jews, etc., etc., disappeared. That is why the Jews had to invent the Mishnah, which are interpretations of the Torah. It is not the Torah. Then, for almost 2,000 years, the Jews went to Spain, Italy, England, Russia. In all the nations of the world, they were divided up. In almost 2,000 years, is the only civilization, the only ethnic group, the only culture that has existed since there have been tribes that in more than almost 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years, they did not lose their culture, their traditions, their religion, or their language. An example. Now that my wife and I live here in Dallas, although we have offices in Mexico, all Mexicans come here to the United States. You know it, because they come here. Nicaraguans, Salvadorans, etc., etc. After four or five years, they no longer speak Spanish. It's a phenomenon because we all seek, right, not to feel isolated. So, our children grow up here, they go to school, English, 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 and they don't want, they want to belong to the culture. They don't want to feel marginalized from others. And it's a disgrace. Because now bilinguals are paid double here in the United States. You go to Europe and a European speaks at least three languages. So whenever I meet, I have three grandchildren who live there in Dallas, two grandchildren, and I tell them not to forget, I say. To my daughter-in-law, teach them Spanish, speak Spanish at home, at school they speak English, at work English, speak to them in Spanish so that they are bilingual, they will earn even more money. A year ago, our daughter Salem, who just got married, they called her from the FBI. She graduated there in Dallas and is currently studying a master's degree at Harvard. And they called her from the FBI here in, was it in Dallas, right? Where they called her from? Yes, Dallas FBI. And they did about four or five interviews with her because of the perfect Spanish and English she speaks. They wanted her as an interpreter. They didn't want to send her to any field. And she began to show them. If you go to Guatemala, the word chango is rude. There they don't say chango, they say ape or monkey. If you go to Colombia for everything, they say yes sir, no ma'am. They call straws pajila. I mean it's impressive how the Spanish language changes. In Costa Rica, the ticos in Costa Rica, they call the children Willis. Willis in Mexico is a prostitute. And I don't say other words. But along here in Latin America, you go to Uruguay, you go to Colombia, there are words that are completely different and phrases that are not the same in Mexico, nor are they the same in Guatemala or in Nicaragua. So what the FBI wanted was for my daughter to be able to distinguish language and dialects as an interpreter, so that when they catch certain people, she could tell them what country they are from by the way they speak and the accent. So this is impressive. And my wife and I prayed, thank God, please that they do not accept her because all the federal agencies right now in the United States are completely corrupt.
It is a completely corrupt government, like most of the world. I thank God that our daughter is now on the job with us, working full time. Thank you, Holy Father. And this is only an example that we give. Because Israel, after almost 2,000 years, they do not lose their culture, their traditions. I repeat, it is unique in the world. Italians come to the United States and I say, your last name is Italian, mine is also Italian, and I speak English and little bit Italian. Why don't you speak Italian? I don't speak Italian anymore, but why? Because we couldn't practice it anymore. Most Germans who come to the United States forget German and speak only English. It is sad that we forget our ancestral language. Well, the Jews are the only group in the world that did not forget this. And when the Bible says, I will bring captivity to my people of Israel, it was fulfilled on May 14, 1948. After almost 2,000 years, after the Second World War, when the League of Nations that is now the UN sees that Hitler kills more than 6 million Jews, and that they killed homosexuals, they killed to gypsies, etc., etc., the Balfour Declaration is made. 1917, when the English had control of the entire Middle East, then the English arrived in 1943 or 44, and gave it complete control and divided the Middle East between France and England, divided the Cisjordania, and gave the Arabs and Jews much of the territory that they currently have and retain. But it was almost 2,000 years. But the thing is not over. Here the first prophecy is fulfilled. The Jews had to return. Number two, they will build the cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink the wine from them. When they arrived on May 14th, they appointed David Ben-Gurion as Prime Minister of Israel. There was not a single olive tree. There was not a tree in Israel. It was a total desert. And a few Arabs, a few Jews lived there. In 1950, in two years, the Jews planted six million olive trees in the most portentous work of hydraulic and agricultural infrastructure and engineering of the 20th century. Why? Because the Bible said that they were going to build and plant trees. Third prophecy, because I will plant them on their land and they will never be uprooted again. May 14th, 1948, May 15th, 1948, 24 hours after they arrive and establish themselves as the independent sovereign state. Five Arab nations arrive to try to remove them and exterminate them. They lost 1956. The Suez Canal War. With Egypt, the Jews win the war again. 1967. The Six Day War, according to General Schwarzkopf. Read the Bible in Mean the Book of General Schwarzkopf's Biography. Who is General Schwarzkopf? He is a German general, a nationalized American who when the Americans came to remove Hussein in the Persian Gulf War, he was the one who led 29 nations. He was a general. From here, from the United States, Schwarzkopf, and wrote a book called My Adventures at West Point, which is the academy in the United States where the best career military personnel are trained. And General Schwarzkopf says the following, I have seen wars, I have studied. Napoleon Bonaparte, Hannibal, the phalanxes of Alexander the Great, etc., etc. Never in history has there been a similar war. That compares to the Six-Day War of 1967, where five Arab nations, led by the president of Egypt, at that time Nasser, brings the five nations together and tells them, let's exterminate and throw the Jews into the Mediterranean Sea. Listen to this. In the law of probabilities, here we are like 800,000 people, very good. Within the law of probabilities, if you are a mathematician, what are the chances we would have of coming out alive? We are going to close it to a thousand people so that we only have 50 rifles. And an army of 30,000 soldiers surrounded us. With our 15s, 
and grenades. Within. The law of probabilities. We would have 10 to the 12th power. Impossible. To get out alive. Were the same probabilities. Open your ears. That the Jews had to get out alive in June 1967. And the Jews. Do you know what they did? That's why they are the best pilots in the world since then. Knowing that the Arabs get up at 7 in the morning to have breakfast. They got up at 5 because an Israeli sergeant intervened with an Iraqi sergeant, where they announced that an invasion was coming. Then, they got on the planes on, June 2nd, and at 5.30 in the morning, they left for Egypt and wiped out all Egypt's aviation. They erased it. They jumped to Jordan and wiped out all of Jordan's aviation, all of Iraq's aviation, all of Syria's aviation, and all of Lebanon's aviation. In six days, the Jews had completely destroyed the attack of five Arab nations. Do you know why they won in six days? Because on the seventh, they had to rest. Unbelievable, right? Well, 1973, the Yom Kippur War, which was 50 years ago, they won again. They have not lost a single war, surrounded by 22 million Arabs. No one is ever going to tear them out again. The Arabs gave up and, and formed terrorist groups. We are no longer going with an army to attack them. We are going to do the urban guerrilla that the communists designed in the time of Lenin in 1923. And now we are going to form terrorist groups that Yasser Arafat started, the movement for the Palestinian nation of Palestine and both the Hezbollah, the Hamas currently, the Houthis, have been continuously trying to exterminate the Jews. And no matter how much they have tried, and no matter how much they continue to do so, and no matter how much Iran supports them, they remain in their land. Now, look at the miracle of last October 7th. On October 6th, the day before the massacre, Israel was on the verge of dividing. Thousands of people gathered to vote to defeat Netanyahu about a judicial reform, and it was a divided country on October 6th. The massacre of October 7th comes, and on October 8th, two days later, Israel was a completely united country. They forgave each other. Thousands of young Jews from around the world fled to Israel to be able to help and join the army to defend their land. The miracle that God did in less than 48 hours. On October 6, they were on the verge of a civil revolution. This thing comes and God uses it to unite Israel. And together now all the young people from all over the world come to join this army that is truly wonderful. To really be able to make sure that Israel can continue to fulfill the prophecies of God. They will never be uprooted from the land that I gave them. And finally, let's read Jeremiah chapter 31. Another impressive prophecy. That silences the mouths of all those who have said that God no longer has anything to do with Israel. I even have a friend that I love very much. But we differ regarding history. And he tells me, it's not that Israel has not fulfilled any of God's prophecies. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry when he told me that. He is a very educated friend of mine. He speaks five languages. But what he told me saddened me. Jeremiah 31, verse 35. I end with this. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for the light of the day, the laws of the moon and the stars for the light of the night, that parteth the sea, and roareth in its waves. Jehovah of hosts is his name. Listen. If these laws fail, that is, the cosmic laws, before me, says Jehovah, also, the descendants of Israel will fail from being a nation before me. Thus, says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured, 
and the foundations of the earth below can be searched. Then I also will reject all the descendants of Israel for all that they did, says the Lord. More proof? What does God say? That his people are indestructible, not because they are good, nor because they are more intelligent or better than Mexicans, than Guatemalans, than Nicaraguans. Simply God in his sovereignty chooses a geographical point in the world. A little dot, see the map. It's an insignificant little dot. Israel. All Arabs, oil-rich billionaires. Israel does not have absolutely a drop of oil right now, and all the nations around, poor people, want to exterminate them, remove them because it is the only democracy. Because the only culture that does not have Islam is that they are not Muslims, that do not have their pagan traditions, they do not have death as their main objective, but life. So for them, they say this nation cannot be in our midst. We have to get them out. And if we don't understand this, we don't understand the geopolitics of the world. And God does it simply. Four. The next thing I'm going to say, Israel is the greatest evidence, the greatest survival that God exists. The survival of this town. No one can deny it. The survival of this town is miraculous. 48, 56, 67, 73. Guerrilla attacks. Hamas attacks. Everywhere. Surrounded by 22 million Arabs who want to exterminate them. Now I repeat, the Arabs are nice, it's just their governments. The Palestinian people. The people of Iraq. The people of Syria, right? The Syrians, the Arabs, right? We have to pray for them. There are many thousands of Christians who are Arabs too. So when we talk about that, we are not talking in general. We are talking, I repeat, about the corrupt governments. That belong to all citizens in the entire world right now. That is why verse Timothy 2 commands us to pray for our rulers. Let us pray for them, Holy Father, who are in heaven. We thank you, Lord, for guiding us and showing us the spiritual atmosphere that surrounds us and knowing that this world is already energized, influenced by forces, spiritual powers of evil. Your word says that things are not going to get better. They are going to get worse for those who live, far from you. But to you, says the Lord, the light will shine. Do not fear, my little flock. In the world, you will have tribulation. But I have overcome the world. My peace I leave you. My peace I give you. I am going to prepare a place for you, so that where I am, you may also be you may fight the good fight. Take hold of eternal life. Strive, my brave men and women, that victory is ours. It is the time to shine. It is the time to bear witness. It is the time of repentance. It is the time to pray for our rulers. We ask you, Father, for President Joe Biden, for Jill, his wife, for his son Hunter, for his grandchildren, for the president of Mexico, Mr. Lopez Obrador, for his family, his three children, by the president of Argentina, that of El Salvador, those of Spain, the communists in Europe. We ask you, Father, that you give them wisdom to govern, that you change their hearts, that you give wisdom to Israel today to know what decisions to make, difficult ones, that they are taking currently in the world. We ask you, Father, that while the time comes to be with you, we have peace in our lives and the hope to which you have called us in the name of Jesus. Amen.